In the summer of 2018, Lourdes and I packed our bags and headed to Europe. And following a, a 13 hour flight that originated out of Ontario Airport, we landed at Dublin Airport, where we soon collect our baggage and headed down to the baggage area where we were met by our good friend, Julian McDermott, who had given us his apartment in Castlenook, oh, yeah. Ireland, which was a stone's throw yeah, from Dublin. He's 35. He's actually 35. Apartment 35 is a middle. But I don't know what. I guess the address is the middle. Okay. Okay, what time is it? So this is like a narrow. Okay, that's his bedroom. This is the toilet. They call it, they don't call them restaurants or bathrooms here, they call them toilets. Yeah. Okay, and this is where we've been sleeping. Yeah, it's pretty comfy. And then, this is Julian's. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of our mess because he's not here, right? he's in Tel Aviv. And this is a kitchen, this is it, it's a tiny kitchen. And he pays how much for this place? What did he say? Twelve hundred? No. I mean, I would do it. It's, kind of, it's cute. And the train is... Oh, yeah, no. I'll film it. But it's walking distance. It has a 12 block. We cross over this, this way. Is there no railing? <laughs> there's no lights either. At night we'd come in and there's no lights. And these uh, locks that hold this water where they raise the water up to move these boats, uh, God knows how many people after several drinks fell in there. <laughs> the 12th lock was a great place for Irish breakfast and uh, an occasional snack or lunch or sometimes an early dinner coming home. And in the mornings after we'd stop there sometimes we'd make our way along the canal and head into uh, the area where we would catch the train. Met a lot of really wonderful people there uh, along the way. The train itself is a marvelous system. You can get anywhere in Ireland on their rail system. Everything from the rails to horse and buggy. They know how to move you around. Dublin is a fascinating, marvelous city with a, a tremendous amount of diversity and color and history and everything from museums to churches and pubs. They have an abundance of pubs and churches, but we spent every day, a part of our day, exploring Dublin and it was absolutely time well spent. Keep 
going, keep going, keep going. Say something into the camera and let me hear you. We're at City Hall. Look at that, there she is right there. Let's do a little zoom in. Look at, there she is, she's lost again. This is Molly Malone. She's quite a legend in Ireland. During the day she sold fish and at night she was a prostitute. But that was a statue where we met for a bus trip that we made on our fourth day in Ireland. And uh, it took us through over the countryside and through the small villages. As you can see, uh, the landscape was absolutely breathtaking. And uh, the bus driver that we had was quite humorous. We enjoyed him thoroughly. Inaccurate because the tallest mountain in Ireland, Curantul, is one of a range that has several. I think it has 14 mountains over uh, 3,000 feet. After about two hours on the road, we stopped at a little restaurant where Lourdes enjoyed her first bowl ever of Irish stew. She's been trying to duplicate that recipe ever since, but without success. 
Our next stop was a little town called Galway. It's a harbor city on Ireland's west coast. It's a popular meeting spot surrounded by shops and, and traditional pubs that often offer live Irish folk music. Nearby, the stone-clad cafes, boutiques, and art galleries line the winding lanes of the Latin Quarter, which retains portions of the medieval city walls. Later that afternoon, we arrived at the Cliffs of Moher. The cliffs are one of the most visited tourist sites in Ireland with around 1.5 million visitors each year. The, uh, the walk up to the top of those cliffs, I could not believe when I saw it. said if you fall off no one's coming for you. <laughs> oh, that's scary. Our next stop was the Kameham Jail, which is a, a former prison in Dublin, Ireland. It's now a, a museum run by the Office of the Public Works, which is an agency of the government of Ireland. Many Irish revolutionaries, including the leaders of the 1916 Easter Rising, were imprisoned and executed in the prison by the British. There was a lot of sadness in that place and a lot of, you could feel the pain and suffering that went on there. That prison held men, women, and children. The youngest prisoner was a a boy six years old who had been imprisoned there for stealing you know, from a local store. The main entrance. Guinness. Anyone who travels to Ireland, the Guinness Brewery is certainly on their bucket list. It's quite a fascinating place and they show you how the beer is made and how it's, how it's all transported. They show you the advertising and uh, even the, the display of all the different bottles that they've had over the years, reminding me a lot of the old classic song, 99 Bottles of Beer on the Wall. And of course we tapped it off by going up to the, up to the top floor, which is a bar huge bar with a 360 degree view of Dublin.
look around. Trinity College. One of the main attractions at the Trinity College is the Book of Kells exhibition, which is located in the old library and contains the four Gospels written in Latin. Later that afternoon, we stop by the hospital to see our good friend Barney Coleman, who's recovering from a stroke. And then after that, it was on to High Street. Uh, it took us a while to find this place, actually well over an hour. But once we got there, it was well worth it. High Street is, is uh, the oldest Kempo school in the world, uh, dating back to the late 50s. This couple here is interesting. Uh, they've been together since they were 12 years old. They're now 16 years old, and we were told they are absolutely inseparable. They train together, and they go to movies together, and they go to school together, and, and they train together. And I have no doubt they'll get married together. Uh, I'm sure they'll have a very lively marriage, to say the least, but absolutely delightful. And we stayed around and we talked and we received some gifts and we, and we, we took pictures. And then from there we, uh, we went on to uh, another Kempo school by Eddie Downey, run by Eddie Downey, a high-ranking Kempoist and a good friend. After another photo session, Eddie took us out to see more sights of Ireland. We had some great conversations along the way, and it was around this time it started raining, which uh, was long overdue. Ireland had had too much sun and wanted the rain. He took us down to a little fishing village. I don't, forgot the name right now, but it was just beautiful. It reminded us a lot of Carmel and Monterey Bay, and to be quite honest with you, I could have retired there right then and there. What a beautiful place. Must be what? Muzzled. Really? Yeah. Look at the health of these trees. This is fascinating. We don't have trees this healthy except in maybe Big Sur. This is all a driveway. Let's go from here, the entrance, all the way here is a driveway to the main house. This is the speaker, speaker's house. This was an interesting relationship, it turns out. The speaker was a, an older man, married a 20 or 21 year old girl, young woman who ended up moving into this Herculean mansion. And she decided she was gonna redo the whole place and she had no less than 80 servants. <laughs> no, she's young, she's kind of learning the ropes. She moves actually from Carton House very nearby. So she's kind of moving next to the walls. She'd previously been living with her sister, Emily, the, du the Duchess of Leinster. So she was here, I said she was very wealthy, and she decides to transform the house, starting with this room. There was nothing here, it was a shed. And she put in what you probably guessed. Patrick built a house, dining room for 
the silk on the walls. Silk, sadly, does not survive easily. The silk you see here is a Victorian silk, in the middle of the 19th century silk. Extreme difficulty, a lot of effort. She is, folks, in Thames Castle, where Braveheart was made. Can you imagine? This is where Braveheart was made, and she's all excited. We're actually at this castle right here, where her favorite movie was made. When asked, how many times have you seen Braveheart? She said, I stopped counting. Well, we neared the last couple days of our trip and went to the grasshopper with Julian. He, he treated us to a wonderful dinner and some live Irish music and we uh, thanked him for all that he had done for us and we uh, said farewell and said we look forward to seeing him again. And then after that, the following day, we joined Eddie Downey and Eddie took us out to dinner to uh, a place called the Duck, the Mucky Duck, a wonderful Irish uh, restaurant pub, and we enjoyed one of our favorite meals, steak on a stone. That steak is actually cooked on a stone. And then in our final day, Lourdes found a park. We weren't looking for it, but she found it, and we spent the last days walking around this beautiful park that surrounds a lake and all the flowers and everything there. It was absolutely marvelous. Thank you. 